creation, the biblical cosmology, the importance of creation in the biblical worldview. There are two competing cosmologies. What is a cosmology? Every worldview has a cosmology. A cosmology is how we understand the fundamental nature, order, and structure of the universe, of reality. A cosmology looks at the nature of reality as it relates to the fundamental structure, the nature of the universe. Cosmologies typically deal with origins as a way of expressing the fundamental beliefs of a worldview. In this world, there are two fundamental cosmologies. Now these cosmologies have many variations to them. They have a lot of different details and applications. But when you boil them down at their most fundamental level, there are two and only two. Let's look at the first one. The biblical cosmology. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. The introduction to the biblical cosmology is in the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. At the most basic level, there are two realities that exist. God, who is the creator. Everything else, which is the creation. If you see in your handout, there's two circles with a line between them. The one on the top represents God. The one on the bottom, creation. The line signifying that the two do not, will not, and must not ever be blurred. God is distinct from his creation. He is transcendent over his creation. The Christian worldview maintains a fundamental distinction between God as the sovereign creator and the creation. This distinction reveals the fundamental difference in the biblical worldview from the unbiblical worldview. It is often referred to in Genesis 1.1 as the absolute beginning. In the beginning. Barashit bara Elohim. God created. In the beginning, there was God. Before the beginning, there was nothing but God. God eternally has existed. Before the beginning, there was nothing but God. After the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Two realities, God and creation. This is explicitly spelled out in the parallel verse. The Hebrew is barashit bara. In the Greek Septuagint, you have the same language. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning, parallel with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning was the word. In Greek now we have more information. Third person and perfect active indicative, which means a continuation. There's a continuing ongoing existence to the word. In the beginning, the word was. Signifying that the word was already in existence before the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Same tense in all of these. He was in the beginning with God. And then we have verse 3, explicitly clear. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. God was already in existence before the beginning, when there was nothing, nothing but God. This God and God alone made all things. 
God, him, God himself is the sole source of everything that exists. All of scripture upholds the distinction between God, the eternal sovereign creator, and the creation. I'll give you three verses, three sections. Psalm 33, verses 6 and 8. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the seas together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Next, Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, nor his understanding is unsearchable. Third verse, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For by him, that is Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So scripture is explicitly clear. God existed alone before the beginning. Then, in the beginning of time, God created the heavens and the earth. All things were created by him and for him. This is the foundation of the biblical cosmology. God, the sovereign creator, he made everything that exists. Fundamentally, then, there are two realities, God and creation. What is the relationship between God and creation? The relationship between these two realities is this. The creation is absolutely dependent upon its creator for everything. Existence, purpose, knowledge, sustenance, ethics, everything. The first commandment is a prohibition against confusing the creator-creation distinction. You shall have no other gods before me. Nothing is to be in the place of God. The second commandment is a prohibition against worshiping anything in the creation and deifying it as God. You shall have no graven images. This is the biblical worldview. This is the biblical cosmology. The other worldview would be called paganism, broadly speaking. Paganism is the exact opposite. In the pagan cosmology, the central belief is this. All is one. At its core, this means there is one and only one fundamental essence in all of the universe. Everything that exists is simply an expression of this monad, this monism this oneness. And in your notes, that's, that's represented by the one circle. Everything that is, according to the pagan worldview, is represented and must stay within that circle. Nothing is dependent upon a creator God who exists outside of that circle. There is no transcendent being. There is no transcendent reality. Rather, everything is independent of God and therefore dependent only upon itself. The main issue, the God of the Bible cannot be believed. However, pagans have many questions that need to be answered. Paganism offers this answer by the deification and spiritualization of the universe itself into various gods and goddesses. Because there is a desire within every man to know something of the divine. But they put it in creation. John Oswald, in his book, The Bible Among Myths, says this, 
The visible world is an emanation from the gods and as such has no real existence of its own. So when everything becomes one and the physical world is nothing more than an emanation from the gods, the physical world loses its own reality. Did you catch that? Did you ever wonder how a man could bow down and worship an idol? It's a piece of wood. It's a rock. It's because when you em embrace that all is one, the physical world isn't really the world that matters to them. What really matters is the spiritualization of the physical world. Again, the visible world has no real existence. The physical, visible world is unreal. It only appears to be real. But real reality is found in the spiritual world, the world of the gods. This is because only the God of the Bible can be known in truth. That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you deny God, you have denied the source of all truth and knowledge. And that includes the world that you live in. That is why in our day as a culture, as we embrace paganism, that is why a biological male can feel like he is transitioning to a female and it be completely accepted. The outer world contains no objective meaning, only subjective. That is what it means to be in a postmodern world. Welcome to pagan America. In his book Gnostic America, Peter Burfried says Gnosticism is a rejection of nature, nature's laws, nature's God. It is ever in rebellion against nature. It favors formless spirituality precisely because Gnosticism doesn't have marked doctrines or creeds, just an open spiritual ori orientation. It's spiritual, not religious. Peter Jones in his book, The Other Worldview, which is a wonderful book, states that this is the greatest threat facing Christians today, Gnosticism. Today, America, along with the church in America, has embraced a new worldview that is nothing more than a revival of the ancient Christian heresy called Gnosticism. Now, I'll use the word Gnosticism and paganism interchangeably somewhat, but the difference is paganism is the broader sense, oneism, all is one, Gnosticism is what happens when you take the pagan worldview and you attack Christianity. Gnosticism. So Gnosticism is a specific breed of paganism that attacks Christianity, and that emerged in the, in the second and third centuries. The Christian cosmology says God is real, and therefore his creation is real. Two realities. The pagan cosmology said the visible world is not real, the realm of the unseen, the gods, that is what is really real because ultimately there is only one reality. But what you see with your eyes is not what is really real. Rather, it is the deification of things that are real. This deification is communicated through myths. Myths are ways, they're stories that explain the nature of reality. They may or may not be true. This is not the point. And that's hard. That took me a while as I read the various myths. It took me a while to get, wrap my, my mind around that. Because in my worldview, if something's not true, you chuck it. <laughs> in their worldview, it doesn't have to be factually true to be true. They believe in denying reality to affirm reality. Law of con the law of non-contradiction does not apply. Okay, so it's a, it's a different cosmology. It's a different worldview. The point is that they help people understand themselves and the world better that all is one. That's the main point. We know this in the word of inclusion. Inclusion. Radical inclusion. 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 
Oneness is the basic presupposition. Everything is interpreted, interpreted through this fundamental belief. Oneism means there is no objective reality because everything really is relative to one another. I will give you one example from the Gospel of Philip. Now, I'm going to be quoting from the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas. They're not really the Gospel of, they're the pseudo-Gospel of. These are things that are, these documents were um, unearthed from, the, from an ancient library that came into view, that we found about, that date back to the, the second and third century. So in the Gospel of Philip, here's an example. It's under the section Light and Darkness. Light and darkness, life and death, right and left, are siblings of one another and inseparable. For this reason, the good are not good, the bad are not bad, life is not life, death is not death. Each will dissolve into its original nature. So if you read the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, these are the statements that you run into. And you go, huh? And they're full of them. This is the opposites, because it's all about joining the opposites together. There's a synthesis. Their God is a th synthesizing God in its original nature. And they have different names for this God, the monad, Abraxas. They have different names for this God. But they believe the highest God is the God who brings all of the, all of the circle together, all the cosmos together, joins the opposites into a synthesis. So light and darkness, right and left, they're siblings. Because each will dissolve into its original nature, which for them is this, I, I, this concept that they have, that for them is their God, is their divine aspect. Main point is there are no real distinctions. All really is one. They really believe that all really is one, that there's no difference between a dog and a pig and a boy and a chair and a dolphin and the ocean and a plant and a bottle and a tree. All really is one. So when they're worshiping an idol, <clears throat> they are worshiping God because all is one. You have to deny reality to get that. Yes, that's why they say to deny reality, you find reality. Yeah, it's crazy, but that's what they believe, and that's what's happening in America. This means, at its core, God and the devil, good and evil, heaven and hell, hell male and female, man, woman, plants, and animal, animals are all essentially one, because all is one. We all have a shared essence. The various expressions that exist are not necessary. For example, Gnosticism understands the various expressions in the physical world to be merely an illusion, the matrix. An illusion that is evil. Salvation is found by a rebirth of knowledge. Gnosticism is from the Greek word gnosis, which is the word for knowledge. So Gnosticism believes in the secret knowledge. The secret knowledge is what I'm sharing with you. Things don't appear as they are. The secret is, it's really all one. Salvation is found by a rebirth of knowledge of the true teaching of the universe that the spiritual oneness is what is really real. The physical realm is an illusion. The pagan hook is a lack of knowledge. Now, from our perspective, yeah, it's the lack of the knowledge of God. I spoke with several people over the past few months who say they know something is not right. Things do not appear as they really are. People are not sure about the nature of reality. We talk to people like that all the time. What's really going on? What's the mainstream media not telling you? Right? And we have all these various streams of information. So there's this skepticism. <clears throat> there's this, what is really going on? That's the hook. Paganism offers various myths to affirm the discrepancies that people see in their world. For example, one creation story. This gets back to the cosmology. 
from the monad, the highest divinity, emanates lower divine beings. So there's a hierarchy of gods known as aeons. The demiurge, one of those aeons, creates the physical world. He was the offspring of Sophia, the lower female goddess. Her offspring is called the crazy evil god who made the world, the demiurge. This world is nothing more than a mistake made by a mistaken god. That's an example of a myth that tells their cosmology. All that you see in this world is made by a mistaken god. It is irrational, it is illogical, it is chaotic. But not all is lost. Sophia, the female goddess, has passed on a spark of divinity from the monad or the abraxas or the, the synthesizing one. If you remember and receive this knowledge, you will embrace your divinity that is inside you. So, that is the hook. That is the myth. That is an example of the pagan Gnostic cosmology. You see, there are two basic worldviews in the world today. Christianity with its creator-creation distinction and paganism all is one. The reason for this is because there are two very different cosmologies. That is the point of Genesis. Chapter 1, verse 2. Chaos versus order. Who is sovereign? Gods or the God of creation? Competing sovereignty. Paganism comes from chaos. God's sovereign rule over chaos is foundational to the biblical cosmology. That is the point of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was without form and void, <coughs> and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, waters are a picture of life, but in the ancient Near East, waters are a picture of chaos. So when you look at the ancient Near East gods like Baal, the Baals, you'll see the Baals standing on the waters. They are the ones who control the chaos. Water is a picture of chaos. Now the word, and the earth was out form and void, tohu, the word void there carries the meaning of chaos. Chaos. This is in the Bible as a fundamental apologetic that stands against the various pagan mythologies. They will speak of the chaos, which is the existential threat to them. The pagan answer to chaos is certain rituals that ensure life will continue through reproduction. The structure of the universe from a pagan perspective is that of chaos, but the gods formed together through reproduction, usually perverted, and acted within chaos to survive it. The example would be the bales standing over the water, asserting their sovereignty over the chaos for the survival of the people. The people serve the gods, so the gods serve the people. The gods required obedience to their rituals in return for the favors. These favors include power, pleasure, victory over enemies, healing, fertility, about anything that a human would want. Because after all, humans make the gods. They deify the forces of nature and call them gods. The origins of all pagan cosmology is chaos. Chaos is the nature of reality. The answer to chaos is reproduction, the way to produce life, and sacrifice, the payment for the blessing. This is expressed in rituals, and these rituals are often extremely carnal. Note, that's the ancient Near East. The neo-pagans today in the West, certainly in the American expression, are not so much as concerned with survival due to the blessings of the sovereign God, 
Rather, the problem is not survival. It is the need for self-actualization, fulfillment, purpose. It's a psychological issue. Okay? So that's the main theme in neo-paganism, in today's paganism. This world doesn't make sense. I need pleasure. I need purpose. And the neo-pagan gods are right in there to help them. Neo-paganism is a call to go back to the chaos to perform the rituals that will ensure the best version of you, not repent of your sins and trust in the righteousness of Christ, but the best version of you, so you can survive and thrive what they call the horrible results of Christianity in general with its freedom, capitalism, and patriarchy. Today, all the forces of hell are focused on destroying God's sovereignty designed in the free Christian patriarch family. The Gay Liberation Manifesto states, equality is never going to be enough. What is needed is total social revolution, a complete reordering of civilization. It will take more than reforms to change this attitude, gender roles, because it is rooted in our society's most basic institution, the patriarchal family. Understand this. Marxism. LGBTQ++++ movement. Feminism. Liberalism. Religious or political. Hollywood. Big business. Big tech. Big pharma. Crony capitalism. Mainstream media. Environmentalism, globalism. What do they all have in common? They all embrace, to one degree or the other, a neo pagan cosmology. All is one. There is only one reality, not two. There is no objective truth. Everything must be destroyed that is based on the Judeo-Christian cosmology, based on the creator-creation distinction. It must be destroyed because it is harmful, they believe. Every boundary God has established must be broken if we, the people in this planet, are going to realize our full potential. They believe the neo-pagan cosmology is superior to the biblical cosmology. And that's a, I had to read that about 25 times. It's like, no, people actually believe this. They actually believe that the pagan cosmologies are superior to the biblical cosmology. It hurts my feelings just to say that, but that's where we are in America. That means that there are no God-given boundaries allowed. No sexual boundaries. There's no creation order. No parental boundaries. God has not given authority to the family. No personal boundaries. You have no God-given rights. No constitution. No national boundaries. We must have open borders. No language boundaries. All meaning is subjective. No truth. There is no objective reality. No judgments allowed against us, anyway. Everything is a matter of what we think. All is one, no exceptions. And listen, for them, they like money, but it's not about the money. It's about their religion. This is a religiously motivated world view. They're not in it for the money. They like money. But they believe this. This is their core presupposition. The removal of all boundaries leads to chaos. They know that. They believe they must go back to the chaos, i.e., the pre Christian era, so they can be free to establish their sovereignty as their sovereignty as gods in this world. This is what is really going on. <clears throat> this is the cosmic battle. And it is into this world that Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 speaks. God speaks to the chaos. 
Genesis 1-2. And the earth was without form and in chaos. This is a picture of that world. This is the picture of the, the world that every pagan myth has to deal with. The chaos. I love it. I always wondered why this was in the Bible. And the darkness was on the face of the deep. Now look at this. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Not in the chaos. Over the chaos. Transcending outside the chaos. And what does God do to the chaos? He speaks. He speaks to the chaos. He gives the command. And so it was. He commands. God said, let there be light. And there was light. The origins of the universe is not a result of sexual union as in pagan mythology. Rather, spoken by a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God, he speaks the world into existence with intelligent language. There's the laws of language. There's the laws of reason. Right there, God is. God speaks. God saw the light and it was good. God's judgment is what stands. God speaks it. It's a reality. God speaks reality into existence. Let there be light. There was light. He sees the light. He makes a judgment. It's good and it stands. And no one can undo what God has said. Next, we see God dividing. Look how often dividing is, were, is used in this Genesis 1. He's dividing. He's dividing. Then God divided the light from the darkness. The pagans hate this biblical cosmology. Remember, dividing light from darkness for them is evil. Light and darkness. Life and death. Right and left. They don't believe in dividing anything. Well, what is God doing? He's dividing the light from the darkness. God brings order out of chaos. Next, God reveals himself. Not as a concept. Not as the unknown. Not as the demiurge or a big bang or an absolute cause, but as a person he created. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. God is a personal God. You can know God. You can have a relationship with God. You can't have a relationship with the concept. You can't have a relationship with the tree. You can only have a relationship with the persons. God is a person. He's a very personal God. <clears throat> he establishes time. He organizes it into seven days. That's the purpose for the planets and the stars. They're, the planets and the stars are not there for the deification of mystical men. The planets are there to give light on the earth. It's God-centered and earth-focused. God establishes time. His purpose reigns. God said, let there be a, a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the water. So God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. God called the dry land earth. God saw that it was good. You can see the boundaries that God established on the earth. He alone is the boundary maker. God establishes boundaries, and boundaries are good. Boundaries are necessary. Psalm 104, verse 9, You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the sea. God makes boundaries. He says to the coastland, This far, no farther. Ocean, you stop here. He divides. He makes distinctions. He actually is a living God who is living and not breathing. He's living. He's alive. And he makes distinctions in his creation. The pagan worldview is against God's boundaries. The pagan worldview is antinomian at its core. Antinomian is anti-law. It hates God's law which puts them in rebellion, not only against God, but against his created order, against nature itself, against reason. The earth brought forth grass, the herbs brought forth seed, each according to their kind. 
God establishes the categorical boundaries for the earth to operate in. The structure of the universe is arranged by the Creator God. Amen? That's the biblical cosmology. God calls it kinds. There's kinds of dogs and kinds of trees. Kinds. Evolution, which makes its play, that by changing the kinds, by joining the kinds, progress is made. And that is because evolution is nothing more than a pagan myth dressed up in scientific language. Pagan mythology was always about mixing the kinds to form half animals, half human, like the satyr, the half man and half goat. Pagan mythology is full of satyrs and half man, half animal type Medusa, ugly kind of stuff. Evolution is nothing more than a pagan myth. It has nothing to do with science. Never has been and never will. In 1859, America accepted the pagan myth of evolution, the confusion of the kinds that would evolve life. It took from 1859 to 1964, the sexual revolution, for the outworking of the pagan myth of evolution to tear down what sociologists call the sacred canopy. That's a long time. The sacred canopy is a removal of the sociological effects of the biblical cosmology. The sacred canopy is there's a male, there's a female, and they know what that means. And a woman would self-identify as a woman, and a male would self-identify as a male, and the roles and the relationships. So from 1859, origin of the species, to the sexual revolution, even though America was falling away from the creator-creation distinction, the sacred canopy still existed in America until the sexual revolution said, enough of that, we're going to be true to ourselves, bunch of pagans that we are, we're going to tear down the sacred canopy. So by the time the 80s rolls around, what most term the turning point between modernism and postmodernism, by the 1980s, the term postmodern is beginning to be describing America's formal departure from the biblical cosmology. Here is the essence of the application of a biblical cosmology. Are you ready? Three essential relationships. And for you guys that are in my equip class, you know what those are, right? I hammer this one. Three essential qualities. I lost my Abraham Kuyper quote. I got these from Abraham Kuyper. He put them, puts them together. I lost my quote. <clears throat> then God, here's the three essential qualities. Ready? God, that's in your notes. God, creation, mankind. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created them in his own image. Male and female created he them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea. Here it is. Abraham Kuyper said, the three fundamental relations of all human life are this, our relation to God, our relation to man, our relation to the world. Three fundamental aspects that sustain life. Number one, God is the creator, the creator-creation distinction. God is the sovereign creator. God is distinct from his creation. He transcends. Number two, on the triangle going down, God at the top, next on the left point of the triangle, creation. All that God has made is creation. Everything in God's creation is dependent upon Him. God predestinates all that is. So everything in creation must find its purpose, design, meaning, and function within God because God preordains, predestinates, and is sovereign over all. That means all life, meaning, and knowledge can only be found in God and God alone. Without God, the earth is empty and chaos. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. God blesses his creation with purpose and knowledge and blessing. And God makes something unique from his creation. And this is important. This is on the other side of the triangle. This must be understood that mankind is created yet distinct. 
Mankind is a created being who is part of the creation. He is dependent upon God, yet he is special, isn't he? He is made in the image of God. The entire Bible builds on these three foundational relationships. Genesis 1 reveals the biblical cosmology and ends with the conclusion. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was tov mahov in Hebrew. In English that means awesome. Very good. It was very good. So there was evening and morning the sixth day. God's design is very good. Gnosticism says God, the Demiurge, made a messed up creation by mistake. You're just a mistake. You need to escape the physical, get to the spiritual to find true freedom and meaning. What does that tell you about life in this world? It's meaningless, it's purposeless, it's a mistake. No. You're not a mistake. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you just how he wanted you. You're precious in God's sight. Your body is precious in God's sight. And the greatest affirmation of this is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Paganism says the very opposite. Creation is bad. Boundaries must be erased by joining the opposites. Synthesis of good and evil, light and, light and darkness up and down is the way of the enlightened one. Then God did something to illustrate that his creation was complete. Didn't need any synthesis. Didn't need the joining of the opposites. Didn't need the up and the down and the light and the darkness. What it needed was rest. And that's the seventh day. The seventh day is it's complete. The seventh day is God's concrete expression that his work is done. That creation is good. That the boundaries he has established should not be bent or twisted. They need to be respected. They need to be obeyed. And that's what wisdom is all about. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Will you embrace that wisdom? Will you live within those boundaries? The Toledoth versus the myth. Toledoth, the creation story. The Toledoth reveals a binary anthropology. The myth reveals an androgenized anthropology. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the Toledoth. This is the history. These are the stories that illustrate the binary anthropology of mankind. Binary means two. Anthropology is who is man. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the days that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Here's one verse I'll give you for free since you have your own Bible that just knocks it out of the park. Isaiah 45 verse 18. Isaiah 45, 18. For this, I'm sorry, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in, there's our word, in vain. He did not create it in chaos. Who formed it to be inhabited. See that? He didn't create it in chaos. He made the world to be inhabited. I am Yahweh, the Lord. There is no other. Now there's an affirmation. It's not confusion. The Toledoth sets this straight. God makes a place for the man and the woman. He makes a place for the man, the garden. And the Lord God formed the man of the dust. He puts the man in the garden. He made the world to be inhabited. Here's the creation of man. Genesis 2 comes around and gives the Toledoth the story that we need to understand. Not only the, the foundation of the biblical cosmology, God and creation, but also the anthropology, who is man. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his life the breath of life, and the man became a living being. 
The definition of a man, then, is a face-to-face -face relationship with God. Imagine that. God takes the dust, forms it, breathes into it. The man opens his eyes. What's the first thing he sees? He sees God. Okay, that's what it means to be a man. A face-to-face -face relationship with God. I believe it's pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. You can ask me why I believe that later if you don't get that. Man made from dust. That means that man clearly is not a god. He is not divine. He is the creation of God. Man will only ever be a man. Why? God clearly says he was made from dust. He was made of the creation. Pagans want to deify man all the time. You are gods, right? God says, no, you're a man. You're made from dust. God prepares a place for the man. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to in sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the test. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. The purpose, work, stewardship, dominion. This is the work of man. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Freedom! Look at all that you can do! Your kids ever say to you, Mom, Dad, why can't I do that? And you say, Look at all you can do. You can't do that. And they say, oh, mom. God says, look, you can have all of the trees. Have dominion. You can have all of this, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we see Adam, as a type of all men, has a commission. Submit to God, your creator. Respect the boundaries. God. Three fundamental relationships. God, creation, mankind. Adam is to submit to God and respect the boundaries. In creation, he's to relate to the creation by having dominion. Yet he's unique as an image bearer. He's over creation and as an image bearer called to worship God and express the image of God, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion over all the creation for the glory of God. Problem. How could Adam complete God's purpose for the family and be fruitful and multiply? The Lord God said, it is not good. Up till now, everything was good, good, tov mahov. It's not good. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper. He defines the woman, the isha, a helper. The woman, then, is the special crowning jewel of the creation. He's got to teach Adam something, though. The man doesn't know how important it is that he not be alone. Because guys sometimes think, yeah, I can be alone. Okay, let me tell you something. See those animals over there? There's two of those, and 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 there's one of you, buddy. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, dominion. And whatever, ever call, whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable, comparable to him. So God did something. Why did he do it this way? This is instructive. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took a chunk, a rib, out of his flesh, closed up its place. And from that rib, God formed the woman. Look at the text. And God brought her to the man. Why did God do it that way? Well, we have highlighted 1 Corinthians 
11, 12. For as woman came from man, and so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. God is highlighting here through the Apostle Paul, giving the divine interpretation so that we don't think that we're independent of each other. We are interdependent upon each other. God highlights the beautiful, complementarian distinction between the male and the female. A complementarianism that we are to complement each other. We are interdependent upon one another. We're not to be independent of each other. For the man comes from the woman and the woman came from the man. And so there's a healthy interdependence there. There's a blessing in the binary. Binary is, means two, male and female. There's a blessing to the binary, male and female, that are joined together first by covenant and then by physical union. Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. So the very understanding of a woman is she's taken from a man. Why was she taken from the man? She was taken from a man, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, she was taken from a man for the man. To complete the purpose of the family, the dominion man mandate, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion. Adam says, you are bone of my bone, equal in essence. A man and a woman are equal in their essence. A man is not better than a woman, and a woman is not better than a man. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But he didn't call her Adam. He didn't call her Ish. He calls her Isha. He calls her woman because she's distinct from the man, unique in creation. Why? For man is not from woman, but woman from man, nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. 1 Corinthians 11, 9. Very instructive for the family. Very instructive for our homes. Very instructive to, to lead us away from the Gnostic lies. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now, what joins the man and the woman together? Covenant. Spoken words. How does God create the universe? Covenant language. He speaks. He makes a covenant with creation. He speaks his word. That word is obeyed, and that obedience to the covenantal word forms reality. Well, he formed it himself. The creation responds to that. How do you enter into the sexual union? Only through covenant. Therefore, the proper authorities give their blessing. A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. Before that happened, God brought the woman to the man. Gnosticism reveals an androgenized anthropology. Scripture says it's not good for the man to be alone. They have all kind of myths and nonsense that counter every one of this, every one, every one of the creation story. Every aspect that I just went over, the myths about Sophia and having and birthing the demiurge in a way that she wasn't supposed to. That's the basis of, of the of the feminist myth, pagans in general, and the Gnostic tradition in particular, for them, the fall was not into sin, but rather, the Gnostic tradition says that the fall was when Eve was separated from Adam. This is because the original people were neither male nor female. Adam was originally an androgenized person. Androgyny is the combination of the masculine and the feminine characteristics into one ambiguous form. That's androgyny. The Gnostic Gospel of Philip says, when Eve was in Adam, there was no death. When she was separated from him, death came. If she enters into, if she enters into him again and he embraces her, all will be well. So there, for the, from the Gnostic perspective, 
the original man was, was a he, she, androgenized person. Okay? Eve came out of that, the, in other words, Sophia, the woman, came out of the man. Separated. There's your binary. Okay? You know the LGB2. They're all against the binary, right? They hate the binary here. Binary this and binary that. This is why. Because they believe the archetype of humanity is androgyny. The fall and death happen when you separate the male from the female. And they have all kinds of myths to... I'm like, really? I had to read this about 10 times and read it in several sources. <laughs> They really believe this. I didn't know that. This stuff's been going on for ages. They have, there's examples. I have one example, 1800 BC, where the priest had the long hair and the makeup and effeminate men. Guys wearing makeup and doing this stuff has been around forever. Since the fall. The only thing is we've had a biblical cosmology in America, in the West. <clears throat> Joining of the opposites, removing the male and female distinction. The Gospel of Thomas, verse 22. And again, the Gospel of Thomas from the Nag Hammadi Library. Sometime, the Gospel of Thomas is anywhere between 60 and 250. Again, Gnosticism is what you get when you have paganism fighting against Christianity. <clears throat> In the Gospel of Thomas, verse 22, it says this. When you make the male and the female into a single one, so that the male will not be male, nor the female be female, then you will enter the kingdom. Because of their oneness cosmology, all of the boundaries God has established must be removed, including male and female. Jubal Singer, a disciple of Carl Jung, Carl Jung being a very strong proponent of pagan spirituality, the archetype of andro andro androgyny appears in us as an innate sense of the primordial cosmic unity. The sacrament of monism functions to erase all distinctions. Brothers and sisters, we see this everywhere. This is the spirit of our age. This is Gnosticism. Now put it all together. The seen world is not real. What is real is the spiritual realm. That makes us all one, the monad. Everything then is divine. We all have the sparks of divinity within us. This includes the male and the female. So transgenderism is the spiritual expression of the rebirth of a Gnostic cosmology. Because the church in America has largely been brought into Gnosticism, it is powerless to stand against this. As a result, the church has lost her children. This is where we are in the West. The need for our day? Embrace the biblical worldview. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation, restoration. This starts with the biblical cosmology. Creation sets forth a biblical cosmology. The nature and structure of reality is two fundamental realities. God and his creation. Creation is dependent upon God for everything. Three essential relationships. God Creation, mankind. The Toledoth, the creation story in Genesis 2, sets forth a binary anthropology. Adam and Eve made in the image of God, equal in essence, yet distinct in function. God establishes the male and the female, and this establishment is good. They are joined together, not in androgyny, but by covenant where the male does not cease to be male, nor the female cease to be female, but they are brought together and blessed with a fertility blessing to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion for the glory of God. This is God's purpose and blessing for the family. The church is called to stand against the seducing spirit of our age and embrace the biblical cosmology. Peter Jones in his book states, what is this is what is happening to our world. America and the church is embracing a pagan cosmology. It is revealing itself in the blurring of the male and female distinction because of the rejection of the creator-creation distinction. It always follows in that manner. 
That is exactly what we see in Romans 1, isn't it? Because all they knew, although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. For this reason, God gave them up to a vile passion, for their women exchanged, na exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. They forget God, they forget nature. They forget God, they sin against nature. They sin against God, they sin against nature. They blur the distinction of, the, of God as the creator and the sovereign organizer of all reality, and they blur the distinction that is clearly written within the nature itself. The result of rejecting the biblical cosmology is that God gives them over to a depraved mind to do things which are not acceptable, and it includes Lesbianism, homosexuality, LGBTQ+++++, Romans 1, 18 to the end of the chapter. God's wrath is now being revealed in America. This is the only thing, I believe, that is truly unprecedented in the Western world today. What do we need to do? We need to embrace the biblical cosmology. It is the foundation for order and structure to reality to all who will bear the fruit. Those who will embrace the biblical cosmology, they will submit to God as defined by his law of word. They will not rebel against his design and boundaries. Amen? They will participate in the covenantal structure of life. They will not participate in evil. They will enjoy every day, every day living as an expression of God. They will not get caught up in fantasies and myths and distractions. They will study God's word and study creation for wisdom. They will not refuse God's revelation in scripture or creation. They will celebrate the distinction between the male and the female. They will not blur those distinctions. They will celebrate the joining of the male and female together only as God joins them in the holy covenant of marriage. They will not join in or separate, I'm sorry, they will not join in or support the uniting of same-sex androgynistic forms and expressions. They will seek to promote clothing, art, fashion that is consistent with their God-given gender. They will not cross-dress, take sex-altering hormones, or seek to look like those who do. They will promote male, loving, servant leadership in the church and family. They will not promote female leadership in the church and family. They will promote the blessings of womanhood as a gift from God, including wife, mother, and all the ways that women are gifted to serve their neighbor. They will not downplay the traditional blessings women have to offer. They will promote a culture of life. They will not promote a culture of death. They will love as God loves with definition and truth and sacrifice. They will not selfishly exalt themselves over others, use them, and call it love. They will respect private property and the responsibility to own land, family, and the means of production and dominion. They will not reward irresponsibility, laziness, steal from their neighbors, and call it social justice. They will share the gospel of Jesus Christ and make disciples in his name. They will not blaspheme the name of God and defame his son as just another Christ. They will promote a biblical cosmology in belief and joyfully develop its implications for all of life. They will not slander the biblical cosmology in its various forms and expression. They will embrace a biblical worldview. They will not rebel against God. Those who embrace the biblical cosmology as a church, we, the church, will stand against the wiles of the devil and build our lives on the word of God for the glory of God. And in the end, 
we will overcome. That's the purpose of a biblical cosmology. Let's pray.